On this Garnet Research Roundup, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Sarah McKinn, who works for the University of Dundee at the James Hutton Institute. And we're going to be talking about a paper just published in New Phytologist, the title of which is Interaction Between Rotype Genes in Barley Controls Merisem Determinancy and Reveals Novel Routes to Improved Grain. Okay, so thanks for joining us, Sarah. It'd be great if you can give us a, a general overview about the paper, please. Sure, I'm happy to do that, Joanne, and thank you for the opportunity. So this paper describes a study we did to try to uncover more about how a barley inflorescence grows. So a barley is characterized by having a spike-like inflorescence, which means at the top of its stem it has um, a compressed series of spikelets. So spikelets are the basic reproductive unit that you find in grasses. Mm -hmm. And barley is similar to wheat in having this spike inflorescence that is lined with spikelets, but something very unique to barley is that each spikelet is part of a triple spikelet cluster. So they're in little triplets okay. alternating up this axis. Mm -hmm. And in wild barley, as well as many of the barley cultivars that are grown in our fields, only one of those spikelets remains fertile. It's okay. the central spikelet. So you have one spikelet and it has on either side very two small rudimentary spikelets that never set grain. And that's what you see in the wild. And we think that those rudimentary spikelets may be important for seed dispersal. Okay. But shortly after domestication, um, farmers selected varieties where those lateral spikelets now became fertile and set grain. Mm -hmm. And so those type of spikes are called six row spikes because they have six rows of grain as opposed to the two row wild type, two okay. rows of grain. Okay. So understanding that switch has been of a, you know, uh, has been kind of ongoing interest. So there's two reasons to understand that. One, fundamentally, from a developmental biology point of view, it's very interesting to understand those mechanisms that barley evolved to suppress the development of those spikelets. But on the other hand, the other side of interest is agronomic. Yeah. So we can get more grain off of a barley spike. Now, unfortunately, those six row varieties that are grown at the moment have some um, issues which prevent them from kind of achieving their yield potential. So okay. even though we have triple the number of grain on a spike, you don't get triple yield. Okay. And this is because those six row varieties don't have as many side branches. Okay. So the plant itself doesn't make as many spikes. Mm -hmm. And the grain that you get off of those um, now fertile lateral spikelets tend to be smaller. So you end up having from one barley plant a uh, uh, a wider variation in seed size and like weight and dimensions, and that's bad for using that grain for malt. Okay. So that kind of gives you the background of the problem that we were looking at. So, right. um, so there's a lot of interest in like, can we make those six row varieties better? Mm -hmm. Can we improve yields, total yield, and can we improve that grain size uniformity? Because once you do that, then you can sell that grain for malt, and that's a premium product. So farmers make a better, better living if they're if they're if they're selling for that. Okay. Um, so in this study, we examined a series of so-called row-type mutants. So these are lines that have a single mutation in one gene, mm -hmm. and that causes them to make this switch from two-row to six-row. So these would normally be two-row varieties with infertile lateral spikelets, and they now have this mutation, and they, they gain that fertility. Okay. Um, and what we did is we took those and we examined them in a lot of detail to, in the same genetic background. So they were in a so-called isogenic background. Yeah. So we could compare different phenotypes between those alleles. And we asked, how does that switch happen developmentally? So when does it happen in development? When do those lateral spikelets decide um, um, to commit to being fertile. And so we're able to show that that was at the point of carpal emergence very, very early in spike development. Okay, so um, so it's an absolutely great uh, introduction there. So does that mean that the, um, the barley that is grown in the fields at the moment are mutant varieties? So that, do they have mutants in these? In absolutely. These so the, two, the six row varieties that are grown at the moment, mm -hmm. they contain two of the alleles that we okay. were looking at. Okay. So there's two, and these these genes that control the switch are called row type genes or yeah. VRS genes. Okay. And there are two VRS1 and VRS5, and they're all those alleles are always together okay. in the six row cultivars. And we now know that those encode transcription factors. So 
it's a loss of function in those transcription factors that generate the lateral spikelet fertility. So, so the kind of active suppression that you see in wild in the wild barley mm -hmm. and in the two rows, that's the action of many genes. Yeah. And these are two critical genes. Yeah, I see. So, so and we, we, we research over the past decade or so has now cloned the remainder mm -hmm. of the major genes. And so so cloning, for example, VRS3, that was a, a major paper that we published last year um, where we showed that that was an epigenetic modifier. So it's definitely about controlling gene expression. So there's a cascade of gene expression mm -hmm. that leads to this suppression in the lateral spikelets. And it's by losing those transcription factors, their activity mm -hmm. um, and or changing the epigenetic status around target genes that leads to this um, this growth. And so we, we also kind of address that question. So how has gene expression changed in these Rho type mutants over development. And so we were able to show that, you know, cytokinin biosynthetic genes are upregulated, for example. So we looked at a series of target genes. But we also wanted to understand, now that we know what those rho type genes are, we wanted to know how they were regulating each other. So by precisely identifying the developmental stages where this switch was taking place and then examining for rho type gene expression in the various mutant backgrounds. We were able to construct this network okay. where this VRS1 gene is the critical node and we have several VRS genes kind of acting upstream. So okay. we had that gene expression data, but what, what really strengthens this study was that we were able to, we made double mutants. Wow. So okay. now we have double mutants and we were able to generate, you know, in more, uh, I guess, move that spike much more to the six row, 100% six row. So. So okay. many of these mutants would only be in so-called intermediate phenotypes. So okay. some of the lateral spikelets would be fertile and some of them weren't. So we made these double mutants and some of them were 100% six row, but we also, um, you know, we uncovered epistatic relationships yeah. that support this cascade of gene expression and activity. But we also uncovered some, some double mutant phenotypes we didn't predict. So okay. we uncovered double mutants that had branching in okay. their spikes. So that was um, suggesting that these genes controlling this spike of fertility are also important for regulating the, 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 the unbranched single axis spike. Okay. And we also saw in a couple of those double mutants that we were able to increase spikelet number at particular points along this spike. So normally you would have three spikelets and in some positions we are now getting eight. So so some of these genes involved in lateral spike of fertility are likely involved upstream and kind of determining that triple spikelet form. So we were able to kind of uncover that and they're, okay. they're modifying each other's function. I see. So uh, yeah, as you, as you described beautifully there, so there's a, a great deal of genetic interaction here and there's, there's a lot of really detailed SEM work as well within the paper. So putting all that together, are you able, are you, uh, do you think at the end of this paper, are we in a better place now to understand how we might be able to develop six row barley which gets more grain for, your, for its barley. Absolutely. So, I mean, that was that was the other, um, I guess, um, uh, nice quality of this paper is that we do bring it back to those agronomic okay. traits. Mm -hmm. So we did, a, it was a lot of work for the postdoc on the project to mm -hmm. do all this phenotyping. Um, and um, so uh, Monica Zurich is her name and she, um, you know, was examining these double mutants and she noticed that the side branch number was was different. Okay. So in you know the single mutants, you always have a lower number of side branches, but in in a particular double mutant, the 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 number of side branches and also the kind of kinetics of their um, emergence was just like wild type. Okay. So even though these spikes had a huge number of fertile spikelets and they made um, a, a very high number of of spikelets, so you know moving away from this three triple form, you know, to eight, ten spikelets, right. they still made just as many side branches as the normal two row wild type. So were we able to, we were basically able to kind of uncouple that. Okay. Um, and, and it likely is happening very early in development. So I don't think it's, it's you know, a, a resource allocation issue that the plant's predicting. So normally the plant predicts, okay, I've now increased the number of spikelets on my spike, so I'm not going to make as many side branches. Mm -hmm. But what we've done in this double mutant situation is we've, I think we've altered that communication. And so now you get spikes that have lots of spikelets and that have 
a, on a plant that has a lot of, uh, of side branches. Okay. Now, some of those spikelets are, they don't set grain because um, kind of later in development. So I think there is resource limitation eventually, okay. um, but that's separate from these early developmental decisions. Okay. And in another two row variety, yeah. we also see that that grain uniformity problem that normally we see these you know quite large central grains mm -hmm. and these small lateral grains, what we see is they're now indistinguishable. Okay. So when you do kind of grain parameter analysis, those grain are all the same. Now they're they're smaller, mm -hmm. but they're all the same. The same. Okay. So so that's suggesting that, and, and we don't know we don't know why. So my hunch is that you know it's something very early in spikelet development that those lateral spikelets are developing more like central spikelets, potentially vascular strands, etc. What is it that you know um, we're now getting this this uniformity of, of their development? Maybe competition between spikelets is different, and and so their their resource sharing better. We don't know. That's, okay. That's well, kind of a, so so usually uh, I I ask you know what the future work is coming from this, but I think you've really given <laughs> us some some clues as to the direction that you're you're taking in the lab. So so I certainly encourage people to uh, to check out the paper and uh, you know looking a little more detail about what Sarah's talked about today. So thank you very much, Sarah, for uh, for discussing the paper. It's been great. Thank you very much.